guys um you're welcome to <laughs> igcsc geography and um in this episode we'll be looking at syllabus content 2.4 and it has to do with weather um after you watch this video if you have any question please comment if you need any aspect of geography and environmental management you're having any issues with you can comment on the comment you can write in the comment section so i can do a video uh, on that particular aspect so um today we'll be looking at um weather and it's uh quite not a bulky aspect so let's just quickly move through it so you can pause and read through your um you can pause and read through the syllabus content quickly now the first thing we should be able to describe how weather data are collected so using different form of weather instrument how you collect weather data make simple calculation using um, from information from weather instrument use and interpret graph and other diagrams showing weather and climate data now definitions of key terminology what is weather and what is climate now the temporal state of the atmosphere in terms of temperature humidity precipitation which can be in the form of uh, snow rainfall and hail wind speed and direction sunshine hours visibility and uh, so is the state the temporal state of the atmosphere why climate is the average weather conditions um in an in a given area over a long period of time uh, is usually between a period of three decades approximately 30 uh, to 35 years so what that means is if i get the temperature data of an area for 30 years now if i get the temperature data for a day i'm looking at the weather or for that particular time i'm looking at the weather but when you've gotten those set of temperature for about approximately three decades and you get the average temperature for that area then you are now looking at uh, the climatic data so quickly how describe how weather data are collected so the first thing is we'll look at a stevenson screen um these are aspect that comes out a lot in your exams so you take note of it because a diagram of a stevenson screen can be given to you and you'll now be asked to describe why is it kept there why what is inside why is it placed there what is the importance so you just need to know how to work around this using uh, some basic skills you, you you've learned during the course of uh, uh, this uh, lesson during the course of you covering your syllabus so Stevenson screen a Stevenson screen is a box like structure that houses weather instrument so there are, is a box like structure as you can see and it houses weather instrument so inside you have a barometer you have a six thermometer you also have a hygrometer now how Stevenson screen is adapted to its functions now if you look at it carefully the first thing is it is on raised on poles so it is not kept on the uh, uh, ground surface or on the concrete floor it is on raised on poles and this pole is approximately at least it's one meter above ground level and the importance is it helps to reduce heat radiation so heat radiation from the soil will not affect the reading inside the Stevenson screen and another thing you should know is it's located on grass there are grasses here so you cannot locate the Stevenson screen on a concrete floor and feel that your data are actually correct is wrong so it's located on grass not concrete as heat radiation from concrete is artificially higher than that from grass now, and it's also coated in white paint now you see it is not black in color it is actually coated in white paint and the major importance is, is to reduce to reduce absorption of light and heat from the sun coated in white paint to reduce the absorption of light and heat from the sun and it has a louvered uh, the louvered are actually slated see it's slated in this format it's slated it is not covered so it's slated um, to allow free flow of air inside the Stevenson screen and it's located away from buildings located away from buildings 
as this may radiate heat and block free flow of air and it's usually fence uh, is fence to reduce tampering from animals and also from um, individuals so once you come to collect your data you have a constructive uh, data and it is not placed under a tree because the tree also will form a shade and also which will affect the data now how to measure rainfall to measure a rainfall you need a rain gauge rain gauge is the instrument used to measure rainfall now using a rain gauge how will you use it to measure a rainfall now we have a diagram of a rain gauge here now a gauge stood in ground so you see it is in ground so at ground level here you insert the rain gauge uh, north on the ground surface student ground now slash or below the ground surface or on the ground the surface no but it should be uh, standing on the ground however you find out that it is outside so water that is flowing on this ground level will not have access to be able to enter into the rain gauge now funnel catches rain so the funnel catches the rain slash rain is collected in a bottle so you see the rain will be collected in a bottle also now water poured from the bottle so you remove the bottle and the water in the bottle will be poured into this measuring cylinder now once you pour the water into the measuring cylinder the next thing is to read the water level in the measuring cylinder which measures in millimeters and you use the scale which is in millimeters here you empty the water from the measuring cylinder to set up for the next day so after rainfall once you pour the water into the measuring cylinder let's say the water is up to this level so at that point you take your reading and the reading that says is around five millimeters now best position to place a rain gauge it should be clear from building it should be clear of trees clear of people animals and others from away from interference uh, on grass not on concrete on flat land and should be accessible not on highland regions on flatlands and clear of trees therefore it should be away from interceptions now minimum and maximum thermometer minimum and maximum thermometer uh, is used to measure the highest and lowest uh, temperature so when how do you use a minimum and maximum thermometer when the temperature rises the alcohol inside the left arm of the thermometer while some of the alcohol in the right arm evaporate in the space inside the ball so what happens is you have alcohol here and you have mercury here so when the temperature rises the alcohol in the left arm of this bulb when temperature rise the alcohol in the left arm expand while some of the alcohol in the right arm evaporate into the space inside the box so as this expand it pushes this metal indices downwards which now help to push this mercury up then the alcohol inside this right arm will now do what evaporates into the bulb this right bulb here so two the expanding alcohol on the left is then able to push the mercury up inside the right arm so this mercury will be pushed up here inside the right arm now this pushes a metal index so we have metal index which is left at the maximum temperature reached when the temperature cools the alcohol in the left arm will now what contract so some of the alcohol vapor in the bulb turns back into a liquid the mercury then moves up in the left bulb pushing the same metal index as it does so to indicate the minimum temperature reach now read at the same time each day at eye level and you measure it in degrees so as this expand it pushes the mercury up which now pushes this metal index up
So this metal index will now give you the data for the maximum temperature. So at this time, at this point, we are looking at at eye level here, which is 30 degrees Celsius. But if the temperature is low, the mercury in the left bulb will contract. And once the mercury contract, what will happen? This metal index will also move up because the, it's now uh, the mercury here too will move up. And where it stops, it will now give you the minimum temperature because the left bulb measures minimum temperature and the right bulb measures maximum temperature. Now, how to measure humidity? So we look at the wet and dry bulb thermometer now humidity which is the amount of water vapor given in a volume of air so humidity is more like the water holding capacity of the atmosphere so the amount of water vapor that is found in the atmosphere at a particular time is the humidity so we, we have a wet and a dry bulb thermometer is used to measure um, relative humidity so here we have a dry bulb at 70 degrees celsius then a wet bulb at 60 degrees Celsius, then a wet bulb depression uh, will be 10 degrees Celsius. So to calculate wet bulb depression, it will be dry bulb, which is 70 minus the, the temperature for the wet bulb. So it will give you wet bulb de uh, and depression. So I think in the next slide, we'll now see how we'll be able to detect or get the value of the relative humidity once you have the data from the wet and dry bulb thermometer. So the dry bulb thermometer gives the air temperature. So dry bulb thermometer will give you the air temperature at that particular um, period where you are taking the measurement. While the bulb of the other has a fine muslin cloth. So you can see it has a fine muslin cloth here uh, wrapped around it. Beneath it has a container for water from which a wick of clothes lead to the muslin round the bulb keeping the bulb constantly what moist so as it's constantly moist the temperature of the wet bulb which is the temperature of uh, minus the temperature of the dry bulb gives the depression of the wet bulb if this is larger the lower the relative humidity so let's look at this measuring relative humidity still yet now there is something called the extract of relative humidity table and this will be given to you in the exam. So uh, I don't want where students will now begin to try and see how they will cram this, how this relative humidity is. You see some of them trying to look at from 0 to 30 degrees Celsius and they're trying to cram. No, there is no need. If a question on how you should get the relative humidity data is given to you in the exam, this relative extract of relative humidity table will also be given to you. Now, relative humidity is calculated using a relative humidity table like the one uh, shown uh, not below beside sorry now an example of how relative humidity is calculated is shown below now you take the values of both your wet and dry bulb thermometer so in this case the dry bulb thermometer is 18 degrees celsius while the wet bulb thermometer is 14 degrees celsius like i told you, you now calculate the temperature difference which will now give you the depression and the temperature difference will be uh, value for the dry bulb thermometer which is 18 minus value for wet bulb thermometer which is 14. now what you get 18 minus 14 we give you 4. so your temperature difference is 4 degrees celsius now they're able to say if once they get temperature difference the relative humidity is 64 percent now how did they get the relative humidity of 64 percent now you come here your dry bulb temperature so our dry bulb temperature is 18 degrees celsius so you, this is 18 degrees Celsius here. And our temperature difference between the dry and wet bulb is 4 degrees Celsius, which is 4 degrees Celsius here. So at which point we they plot 4 degree to 18 degree, all of them we meet here. So if you draw. So you have 64% relative humidity. Now, um, we have another example here. So how to calculate relative humidity? Um, bam, 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 bam. You see, it will be 14 minus 11, which will now give you 3. So what will now be our relative humidity percentage? 
our dry bulb reading is 14 while uh, our temperature difference is 3 so 14 to 3 here so this is it so the temperature the relative humidity is 69 percent that's it comes out in the exam that's it simple now sunshine recorder how to measure sunshine using sunshine recorder sunshine recorder is placed south facing northern hemisphere so you put sunshine recorder in open space uh, not affected by shade exposed to sun rays top of a building on the pedestal or stand now the lens lens which is a glass ball focuses the sun rays onto a piece of card sun rays cut the card or paper then burn a line in the card paper so it focuses the sun rays on the card or paper and burn a line on the card of paper now you measure the length of burnt line length of burnt line shows the hour of sunlight and this continuous or interrupted line if sun is obscured by cloud now you replace card paper each day uh, and when you put in your sunshine recorder how to measure wind direction using a wind vane a wind vane is used to measure wind direction now the arrow this arrow is what rotates the arrow rotates to the direction of the wind or the direction in which the wind is coming from so it can be north east south west uh, as it is here you have it on the wind vane so the compass points the direction to be worked out so so one if it points like in this case is pointing towards a uh, uh, southeast so it depends on which direction it points so you just take your reading if it is southeast uh, if it is to the east if it is to the north west so so it is actually the arrow once it rotates you'll be able to get the direction of the wind now best place to keep a wind vane wind vane should be kept uh, on the roof top of a building top of a hill wind should be unobstructed so you get full force of wind um, prevent wind being blocked and no obstacle to block wind no trees to shelter the wind vane so we have how do we now measure a wind speed wind speed is measured using the instrument called an anemometer so if you have an anemometer it has cups or dicks so it has cups this is one two and the top cups cups of dicks ball will revolve and spin as the wind blows so you count number of revolution per minute you count the number of revolution of uh, the cups per minute show slash record readings as in kilometers per seconds or miles per hour so once you calculate numbers of minutes it revolves then you now convert to get your data your value now how to measure air pressure air pressure is made up, measured using the instrument called a barometer now barometer are used to measure air pressure now air pressure is normally measured in millibars measure the millibars now barometers are normally kept inside a stevenson screen to keep them safe now a barometer has a movable needle or a movable needle or a pointer the pointer can be moved to the current reading so that you can then make a comparison with the reading from the following day so you have a pointer needle here which moves then you take your reading in millibars now we have digital instrument to record weather so we just look at individual instrument but um, because of um, development and uh, uh, high improvement in technology they are now digital instrument that can give you most of all these data that you look you are looking out for in just one simple instrument now there are importance of digital instrument and there are also disadvantages of using digital instrument so the importance of using digital instrument is one is easy to read so you just come you just take your reading you don't have to stress yourself to look at values you just write it down like in this case you can see it 
uh, 60 degree Fahrenheit, the um, humidity is 75 percent. So it's quite just straightforward. You, you don't need to stress yourself. But however, it's instant measurement. That's the advantage. Instant measurement is usually very accurate and it's portable. So it's easy to carry and it's robust, strong and it won't break. And it's easy for you to reset for the to take the next day the data. Now, but the disadvantage of the instrument is battery may go flat. If your battery go flat, then you'll not be able to use it. It may break, it's easily damaged, and it always need calibrating. Now, lastly, I think we'll look at clouds. We'll look at clouds. Now, a cloud is defined as a collection of ice, as a collection of ice or water droplet in the air. So it's a collection of ice or water droplets in the air and clouds are usually measured in octaves. So you have zero octaves, we give you a clear sky, eight octaves is total coverage. Now, we look at types of cloud, we, uh, there are a whole lot, but basically these are the four major types you need to know. We have cirrus cloud, stratus cloud, cumulonimbus cloud and cumulus cloud. We also have... Um, nimbus stratus so you see each of these clouds sometimes are differentiated based on their height from the earth surface uh, so as it moves up uh, the type of cloud changes so you see cirrus is found high in the atmosphere so you see it here high in the atmosphere usually above 5500 meters is common throughout the world thin and wispy in appearance and it moves fairly quickly. Then the stratus cloud, uh, it is a low level cloud. So you see it here, it's a low level cloud, stratus, uh, which is usually below 2000 meters and sometimes reaching uh, the ground level. Usually gray and col gray in color and move fast also, can produce light rain and snow. Then we have the kumu. No limbus cloud is a large cloud that is up to 10 kilometers above and across. Sorry, 10 kilometer high and across. Yeah, so it's about large 10 kilometer high and also across. They resemble giant cauliflower, produce rain, thunder, and lightning, usually found in spring and summer season. Why we have the cumulus cloud, which is also a low level cloud here. It's also a low level cloud with bottom between 60 meters and 120 meters. Uh, looks like lumps of cotton wool. It can produce light rain. Uh, individual cloud have a short life cycle. So you find out that most cloud that produces rain, even the stratus uh, cumulus, Cumulus nimbus, they are majorly low. Uh, cumulus is just cumulus nimbus that is both from low to high because of how large and uh, its coverage. But cumulus and stratus cloud are all low level clouds. So you see, sorry about that. So, um, Next, we'll look at climate.